all of you uh, very, very interesting. I want to start with just kind of a quick question to uh, Ms. Overton. You, you mentioned in your in your testimony that you're a uh, Class Four drinking water operator's license in, in Delaware and Maryland. Is there any cybersecurity training that goes along with the t obtaining one of those licenses? None. None. So there's a gap right there. Uh, and that's probably, uh, I don't know, Mr. Batt or, or, or maybe Mr. Pratt, do you know other license, other levels? Or is, is there ever any cyber, uh, cyber training that goes along with any of the licensures? That, uh, I've gone to lots of training. I've given lots of training with various professional organizations. I've never attended a cybersecurity class, and I can't recall seeing one on an agenda. Perhaps they are out there, but it is not typically required in licensure situations that I'm familiar with. I don't know everything, but it's rare. Okay. Today. Um, let me ask, too, then another basic question. Mr. Sullivan or Mr. Ober, uh, Ms. Overton and Mr. Pratt would probably know this since you're uh, operating local systems. When, if, if you were to, uh, to, to see that a cyber attack is occurring or you're made note, uh, you had the ransomware attack, right? Um, who do you go to first? Do you go to Homeland Security? Do you go to your state? I know you went to your, um, I, think, I can't remember what the organization was that helped you, uh, that uh, helped you solve your problem, but do you, is there a response that's laid out for you to be able to react to something like that? Uh, under, under AWEA, we had already had an emergency plan, should we be attacked? Um, we received an all printers at three in the morning, every printer printed out the ransomware demand of $2 million and, and told us that we were encrypted. We immediately shut down the entire system. We notified the FBI immediately. We notified FBI. the EPA. We EPA. notified our state. And your state. We turned to the Water Ice Act to say we were just attacked. How, what do you do? Right. Who are the experts? Because cyber is a different thing. Right. None of us are trained in it. Now, all of us know about it. We know about the threats and all that, but what to do. Right. So there are experts out there, mm -hmm. and we were able to immediately contact the ISAC who knew of companies who immediately came in and helped us bail out. Okay, Ms. Overton, if you were to sense something or get something on your printer at three o'clock in the morning, who would you go to first? I think we would contact our state and local governments. Uh -huh. It's not necessarily like this gentleman said, Mr. Sullivan said, it's not directly laid out. Right. It's not a training that we've had or hopefully it's coming forward um, to let us know as a small and rural area. Right which is my entire state. Uh, right. So let me ask you this. You, you mentioned the Circuit Rider program, which is, is great for our state. Yes, absolutely. Do they have any expertise or any, um, uh, it, do they bring anything to, the, to, to you on cybersecurity? Not as of yet, mm -hmm. but the tons of educational information, I'm sure that's coming down the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Pratt, do you have anything? Where would you go if you were? Uh, FBI first uh -huh. and the Water ISAC plus our state has uh, some support in that area. I, I do want to echo what Representative Gallagher said, though. Many government agencies have historically viewed IT infrastructure as an optional buy-up versus necessary investment, and we're playing catch-up. And that SCADA marketplace is much less mature on cybersecurity than, say, I, I even had it written down, the financial or medical right. uh, software market. So my, my county was hacked, not in our control systems, but they uh, got in and got some HIPAA records mm -hmm. uh, you know, from an internal uh, type of pathway, and we have had a chief information security officer since that time. Okay. And uh, fortunately, I was able to speak with him prior to coming here to yeah. get his insight on things. But FBI, Water ISAC, and state, I'll say CISO agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bat, uh, let's talk about transportation a little bit, because I think obviously with um, uh, autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles, I mean, actually, I saw a lamp, uh, well, I, I call it a lamp post. It was an enormous post that they were going to be um, installing along one of our major arteries, uh, interstates. And my husband looked over and he's like, what is on the top of that? Well, it was some kind of sensor. We, I don't know what it was. It could have been a weather sensor. It could have been a who knows what. But it was something tied to the Internet. It was pretty obvious there. So I think that we're going to see this more and more. It may have been something to sensitize what, when and how often the light went off and on or whatever. So in, in transportation, where would a transportation um, facility go? Because I am the, I am the um, ranking member on Homeland Security on the Appropriations Committee. There's an organization there, CISA, that's mm -hmm. supposed to be helping all state and local 
uh, in, in a lot of areas in terms of cybersecurity. We're putting a lot of money into that because I think this could help our circuit riders, it could help our state and locals, it could help everybody. But do, where would you go in, in a transportation incident? Uh, so I think that uh, you have correctly identified the major vulnerabilities and many vulnerabilities that exist because as we introduce more of these sensor systems, active traffic management, uh, VMS signs, variable message board signs, uh, closed circuit television uh, cameras, uh, tolling systems, these are all potential vectors or entry points. Right. And so you want to um, delineate between sort of operational technologies, there are vulnerabilities like I just listed out, the IT uh, that is in there where somebody's using, uh, uh, opening up a phishing uh, email, and then all the data that is out there. So, um, you know, Colorado DOT uh, experienced a ransomware attack. Um, you know, the, the the playbook there was to go to the state resources first, but quickly became apparent that it was a, a state-sponsored attack, and so we had to bring in federal resources uh, from Colorado Springs, or they did, I was not there at that time, but uh, from Colorado Springs and other places. And so um, I think that that is one of the reasons for providing federal support to bring all of these uh, uh, states and other transportation agencies up to a level playing field. So no matter whether you're the most sophisticated state or one that's just discovering this, you kind of know exactly where to go. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I think this has been uh, a great hearing and, and eye-opening in some ways because uh, the challenges but also some of the gaps and we know this is an issue that's it's, it's going to grow. It's, it's not like, oh, it's, it's going to shrink and go away. We know it's going to grow. So I thank you for being in the, uh, in the arena. I, I, I did say I thought, Mr. Pratt, when you went to the average age of the, or, you know, of the folks in the, in the room, one of the concerns that I've had and, and that we have actually in our water bill is the next generation workforce. For some reason, this career, which I think is very obviously Mr. Sullivan's been in it for a very long time, holds a lot of promise to, you know, uh, raise your family with and, and to have great expertise and respect, uh, as, as you all do in your community. For some reason, our younger generation is not getting in there, and we're getting a lot. I know in our state of West Virginia, a lot of people are aging out. They want to retire, but to find replacements has been really, really difficult. So um, I'm hoping that um, by shining a light on how, how, uh, how folks have managed their systems for so long, because... I think Miss uh, Miss Oberton said seventy thousand rural water systems. I mean, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of jobs. I just have one question of Mr. Bat, and it was it's um, I, and I, I had to step out a bit, so I don't know if this got uh, addressed in any way. Obviously, we've got a lot of big uh, um, internet companies that gather a lot of data. And, uh, and, and, and that's a subject for a whole bigger debate. I'm not asking you to have that debate. I was just wondering um, if there is any, are there any ideas on the table to partner with some of these private technology entities to be able to help meet the challenges, not just on the prevention, but also on the um, detection and, and other areas of cybersecurity. Are, are you aware of any of those? Uh, yes, uh, Senator Capito, and I think, um, one thing on the workforce piece, I think this is incredibly important because, uh, you know, state DOTs, I remember in my time having to struggle to compete for mechanics, right? Right, Because, you know, we, we would pay a certain wage and private sector uh, companies yeah. would pay more. Well, that problem is exacerbated on the technology side. And uh, I think this idea of creating these workforce cultures is really important. And I uh, would look forward to, to working on that. From a um, large internet perspective, you know, we have, a, um, you know, we have Google and AWS that are, are members of ITS America. And what used to happen was, you know, sort of back in the printer day was you're talking about one device. Now you introduce the cloud. And so, you know, and something that Mr. Pratt said, the more handoffs, the more fumbles. I think that is critical to working with those partners to ensure that as data is going from a vehicle to the infrastructure, up to the cloud, back, um, and lots of handoffs, uh, working with those technology partners to ensure that all levels and layers are secure is really important. All right. Thank you.